morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming today. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. yeah. Good. Awesome. Let's begin. The Embrace, my favorite line of code in C++. It's a very important line of code and one that is all too easy to overlook. Ask a C programmer what happens here. The answer is nothing. Ask a new C++ programmer what's happening. And the answer is nothing? Question mark? I don't know. It's the end of the scope, right? And if you ask a new an experienced, sorry, an experienced C++ programmer, what happens here? The answer is anything. Files could be getting closed. Memory could be freed. Um, buffers could be flushed. Locks could be released. Sockets could be closed. All of the above and more. Who knows what's happening here? And that's the exciting and scary thing about this line of code. A lot could be happening here, but it's hidden from us as software engineers. And because it's hidden, we don't realize how often destructors are actually getting called. My name's Pete. I like destroying things, but safely, with high performance. So I'd like to do just a, a quick poll. Think about the first time you heard the word destructor in the context of C++. Was it before 1995? Before 2000? Before 2010? Before 2015? Just a year ago? OK, good mix of folks in the crowd. Uh, I thought it was interesting, Bjarna said that destructors were part of the language within the first couple weeks. So a core component of the language, so often overlooked, I thought it would be useful for us to do a deep dive today on destructors and see what we can learn. My talks tend to build on themselves, so you may have some questions early on, but it's likely they will get answered later in the talk. Uh, if not, if I don't answer your question, just make a note of that slide number and I will gladly take questions at the end. Lots of people like to take photographs during presentations to capture key things. If there's one photograph you take, it should be of this slide because this has the link to the presentation, what I'm presenting right now. So that way you don't have to take any more pictures, you can just get the presentation. And it also has a link to all the code that I'm showing today. It's in one big block, it's about 500 lines, but if you have any questions about the code itself, you can go there and grab it. I'll pause for a moment for the last photographs to be taken. Everybody good? Awesome. Speaking of source code, it's tough giving a talk at this conference because you might wonder, well, am I talking about C++ 11 or C++ 14 or C++ 98 or C++ 20? Uh, my baseline today is 17. That is the standard that is published, that's official, that um, many, not all, but many of us are using. All the code today that you'll see compiled using C++ 17 enabled compilers. When I show Standard library source code, it's typically from one of these locations. The source code that I'm showing is heavily modified. Let's say that. In some cases, it's modified just to simplify it. In some cases, it's modified to protect the guilty party. Let's say it like that. I also relied very heavily on the C++ core guidelines. If you have not checked this out, super important that you are at least aware of the guidelines. You may disagree with the guidelines, that's totally fine, but they were very useful for me in kind of um, picking apart why are these guidelines here and why are they important. I should also mention that a lot of the code that you'll see today was extracted from my local repository. I work at Facebook Reality Labs. We do research into AR and VR. 
Some of that code is production code. Most of it's research code. Some of it's written by professional C++ software engineers who have been writing C++ code for 20 odd years. Some of it's written by new PhD researchers. So it's really a broad collection of what is happening today in terms of source code. So I saw a lot of good things in that code. I saw a lot of really bad things. And we're going to see a mix of those. The standard, C++ standard, has a three-page section on destructors. But it doesn't really define what they are. So let's start with the definition. This is my definition. Destructors are, one, deterministic, automatic, symmetric, special member function with no name, no parameters, no return type designed to give last rights before object death. Let's break this down. You can have a bunch of constructors. You can have an infinite number of constructors. You only get one destructor. Isn't that interesting? It's deterministic. One of my favorite features of C++, deterministic destruction. There are actually very few programming languages that have this feature, and it is so core to everything we do. That means destructors are called at well-defined times, makes our lives simpler. They're automatic. That's good. They're called when you hit that end brace, but it is not obvious as well. So there's a pro and there's a con here. Symmetric. Stephen Dewhurst said there's this wonderful symmetry of constructors and destructors. They are a special member function. That means the standard calls them out as special. They can't be overridden, for example. They can't be const. They can't be volatile. You can't take their address. That's all undefined behavior. And they are designed to, and this is a quote from Marshall Klein, give last rights before object death, which I love. Marshall Klein also said that destructors are a prepare to die member function. Andrew Kroenig said they are a recipe for undoing whatever the constructor did. And Herb Sutter said a destructor turns an object back into raw memory. These are all good definitions for destructors. By the way, one of my favorite questions for new candidates at the lab is having them describe a destructor to me. You can learn so much about what a programmer knows by having them talk about destructors. OK, so we know destructors are called at that end brace. That's really important. They're also called in a bunch of other scenarios. I've captured, I believe, all of them although you never know with C++. I believe all the places that destructors are actually invoked in this table. I'm not going to go through detail here. I'm going to point out a couple of things. Number one, destructors are invoked in reverse order of construction. It makes sense. That's the natural symmetric thing to do. It's interesting that with statics, it is well defined what the order of destruction is. It's reverse order of construction, but it is unspecified what the order of construction is across translation units. If you have an array, elements are constructed first to last, so they are deconstructed last to first. However, if you have a standard container other than stud array, the order of destruction is unspecified. That means you cannot rely on it, nor should you rely on it, although I'm sure, according to Hiram's law, many people do. Note that calling exit is not recommended. The reason it's not recommended is because local variables are not guaranteed to be destroyed if you call exit. And the last thing I want to point out is that terminate calls abort. So when you see abort on that last line, think of that as equivalent to terminate. No destructors are called. In other words, you want to avoid calling abort because no cleanup will happen, and you generally want to avoid calling terminate, too, because it typically calls abort under the covers. All right, with that all out of the way, let's dive into some real-world code. And we will start with looking at the standard library, standard pair. I've eliminated a lot of code here, so you're seeing the boilerplate for the top of pair. And if you look through both the standard library itself and the standard, you will see that the destructor is not specified for pair. It is created for you automatically by the compiler. 
This is an example of something the standard calls implicit destructors. Those are destructors that are not specified by you. They are generated by the compiler. They are automatically public and automatically in line and automatically non-throwing unless base or members throw. In other words, it's as if you wrote destructor no accept equals default. My proposition here is that the implicit destructor is appropriate for most of your objects. Now, there is one challenge here that I recognize, and that is debugging destructors. Sometimes you really want to know when a destructor is being called, so you, not, you want to set a breakpoint. If you need to do that, what I recommend is you wrap your little destructor that does nothing, you set your breakpoint on, in some sort of debug wrapper so that it's not there in production code. And you'll see why in just a bit. So here's what I recommend when it comes to implicit destructors. Avoid specifying destructors when possible. If you're familiar with the rule of zero, which says if you can avoid defining default special member functions, construction, destruction, move assignment, um, move operations, then do so. Only declare destructors when you actually need them, when you require them. And this is consistent with the rule of five and also consistent with the rule of all or nothing. It also clearly conveys your intent. If you declare destructor, you are saying to the reader of your code, something important needs to happen here, pay attention. If you do not declare destructor, destructor, you are also saying something important. It's implicit. It's doing the right thing under the covers, but for this particular class, there is nothing to destroy. The members destroy themselves. Now, I looked in a bunch of our source code, and it turns out that this sort of code is really common. People just specify destructors because they're used to. This is what I grew up doing as a C++ programmer. I always specified the destructor. I was just in that habit. This code is shamelessly derived from a talk by Jason Turner on C++ Weekly. And it, it's almost line per line what that code is that he showed. And there's a problem here on this line that I have highlighted. And in fact, I'm gonna call this out as a bad problem using this little fellow here. So when you see him, this is coding horror, do not do this. Do not do this. And you may wonder why. Well, a good thing to do, just like Jason Turner did, is to cut and paste this code straight into Godbolt and see what you see when you have a declared destructor and when you do not have a declared destructor. And here's what you'll find out. With the destructor declared, as the code is shown, we generate about 350 lines of assembly. If we just take that line out, that's all we do? 250 lines of assembly. Why less code? The compiler is not generating the call to that destructor. It is generating the call to the string destructor because it has to do the right thing, but is not generating the call to the triple destructor, and you're saving code. So not only is this a good idea, this is a really good idea. Do not have an implicit destructor. So you, re you may recall that I said, well, it's as if I wrote destructor equals default. So maybe we could do something like this and be okay, right? That seems reasonable. But the act of simply declaring the destructor as default or delete does something even more important. It suppresses the implicit declaration of move construction and assignment. So now in this code, bad, it's even worse because the code ends up copying the strings under the covers. We wanted move, and move should happen, but the moment we declared a destructor, even though it does nothing, we suppressed move. 
hopefully you viscerally feel the importance of this advice. So my strong recommendation is the best destructor is no destructor. Embrace the implicitness of destructors and only declare them when they are required. There's a question in the back. So the question is, significant impact on number of lines of code, is there a significant impact on performance? Honestly, I haven't measured performance, but even in terms of instruction cache and things like that, you'll notice it's GCC 03, so I was using the optimizing compiler. You are producing code that may or may not get optimized away by a good linker, but the point is, there is code that's getting generated that you can avoid simply by removing a line, and the right thing still happens. Does that make sense? Okay, great. So think of triples as destructors. You want to minimize them. Awesome. Time to move to a different topic and a new example. This is standard bit set. And in the yellow, I'm calling out an important aspect of bit set. It is an array of plain old data. In this case, unsigned long, long. And there is no destructor declared. This is an example of not just an implicit destructor, but also what the standard calls a trivial destructor. Because this is a destructor that doesn't need to do any work at all. It's just an array of plain old data. There's nothing to do when we're done with it. Zero lines of code generated. So any class that you have that's just plain old data or arrays of plain old data have trivial destructors. We love trivial destructors. It means we don't have to do anything. This is good code. And I'm using this emblem to indicate, yes, this is good code in general. Here are the requirements for a trivial destructor. First of all, it has to be implicit, not declared, or defaulted, but as you saw, using defaulted might not be the right thing. So implicit, ideally. It must not be virtual. All base classes must have trivial destructors, and all non-static member data must have trivial destructors. If that's all true, then you have a trivial destructor. The standard describes many classes that are guaranteed to have trivial destructors. For instance, most atomics, like atomic of int, are guaranteed to have trivial destructors. And with the trivial destructor, compiler can just optimize it away. We will come back to trivial destructors later. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that all trivial destructors are implicit, but not the other way around. So with standard pair, if you have standard pair, for instance, of two ints, then it is, it does have a trivial destructor. But if you have a standard pair of a string and an int, it is a non-trivial destructor because string is non-trivial. We will come back to trivial destructors in a bit. Now it's time to look at some code taken from my home repository. And I've merged some things together to make it a little more, um, Bad, let's just say bad. Okay, this is bad. And I wanna talk about this in some detail. This is a classic destructor. You will see this all the time. If you look in code in your home repository, you will probably see code exactly like this. My argument here is that there's actually only one line of code that is strictly necessary in this destructor. In other words, we're doing a lot of unnecessary work, and in some cases, redundant work. So keep in mind, we're on the verge of death. Warp core is just about to go away. Keep that in mind. So that first line, we're checking, is dilithium chamber not equal to null pointer? But delete checks for that already, guaranteed. It's part of the standard. So we're doing extra work there that we don't need to do. We should just call delete. And then we're setting dilithium chamber to null pointer. Never mind that in a very few instructions, this object is gone. Like we can't use it anymore. Using it is undefined behavior. 
Why would we set it to null? Some people will argue, well, that makes for better debugging, right? I can't now double delete it if I accidentally call delete again. How could you accidentally call delete on it? It's gone. In fact, it would be better to call delete on the actual pointer, not null pointer, then your tool set would probably say, hey, you're doing a double delete here. So just leave it alone. Don't clear data unnecessarily. Oh, speaking of clearing data unnecessarily, let's suppose matter antimatter reactor is a vector. And we're calling vector clear. We're doing redundant work. That vector is just about to be destroyed. We don't need it anymore. Why would we do that extra work? Same with reset. That might be a unique or shared pointer. It is going to get reset at the very end of this destructor body. It's member data. And the last line, we're setting account to zero. Now, if this was a global, maybe that would make sense, or if it was uh, some shared data. But if it's just member data, no reason to set it to zero. I can only think of one example when you might want to set it to zero. Uh, maybe it was a password field or some sort of cryptographic data that you actually wanted to clear out of memory. This is the rare case I can think of. So this code could really be simplified down to a single line and still be doing exactly the same thing, accomplishing exactly what we need it to do with much less work. Let the member data clean up after itself. If the member data is not cleaning up after itself, it's probably not doing the right thing in its destructor, go fix that destructor. Both delete and free, most people don't know this, both delete and free handle null pointers and null internally, automatically. So checking for null is redundant work. I want to show a little more nuanced example that is similar and yet different. So now in our warp core, we have a shutdown function because we also have a startup function. So we have a warp core object. We can shut it down. We can start it up. We can shut it down. We can start it up. Great. So in our warp core destructor, we call shutdown. Kind of makes sense, right? We want to leave the core in a safe state because we might be restarting it again, except it's a destructor. There's no way we could restart it again. But we're reusing code. That seems good. Technically, there's nothing wrong with this. But if, from a performance standpoint, we are doing redundant work by calling shutdown in the destructor. Now, maybe for warp core, it doesn't matter because we're probably not destroying warp cores very often. Let's hope not. We probably create them and we use them for a long time. But if this was a string, for example, calling shutdown every time we destroy the string, that could really be causing some performance issues. And those performance issues might well be hidden behind that little end brace and we never notice them. So I will declare that this is a coding horror and you should avoid it if possible. And really, destructors should be short anyway and it should just look like this. So think of it like this. A public function must declare, must maintain class invariance. In other words, if I call shutdown, it then must be okay for me to call startup. Whereas destructors don't need to maintain class invariance because that object is just about to die. It's gonna go away. And because we have this thing that is at odds with each other. If you see a public function called from with a destructor, that is a red flag. That is a red flag that you may be doing redundant work, too much work, extra work that you could avoid. So my recommendation is that in general, you avoid calling public functions in destructors. This is a guideline because this is a red flag. Make sense? There's a question here. So the question is, am I really talking about public member functions? What about private member functions? If it's a private member function, a private member function doesn't necessarily have to maintain a class invariant, so that might be okay. Still could be a yellow flag. A public function does have to maintain those invariants, so that's more of a red flag. Okay, speaking of warp cores, here's one of my favorite engineers. Like you, Mr. Scott has noticed that our warp core object is still deleting a raw pointer, which brings us to our next case study. 
Here we have a raw resource. We have a Windows handle in our phaser object. And in our phaser destructor, we look at the event, and uh, if it's not null, we close that handle. Doesn't seem unreasonable, right? Coding horror. This is a raw resource. A handle is essentially a pointer. We want to make sure it gets cleaned up. It is getting cleaned up here, but we could do better. There's also a bug in this code. And ironically, right next door, in our repository shared common library, we have code that looks something like this. You probably have code that looks something like this. Or maybe you use some open source scoped handle type wrappers. Maybe you even use unique pointer, which you can use with handle and a custom deleter that calls close handle. So this class guarantees that that handle always gets cleaned up, and it's doing the right thing in the destructor. It's checking H against Windows invalid handle value. So this is doing the correct thing. So we should just use this public, well-tested code that wraps this single object and always does the right thing and uses scoped handle or some similar type of object around this phaser event, and then we can avoid that cleanup code. And in fact, if we encapsulate all this other data in our phaser object in owned objects that own their data, it's likely that we can do exactly what we want, which is eliminate this destructor altogether. So put any resource that needs to be released in its own object. This is the whole point of resource acquisition is initialization. So you're probably thinking, oh, come on, Pete, is this really that important? Come on. Let's look at Uhura for a moment. Uhura starts out like this. She owns one resource. She news up that resource in the constructor, and then she deletes it when she's done. So that, that seems reasonable, right? Well, now let's suppose she goes on her five-year mission. More data gets added here. More members get added. And then some programmer at some point adds another raw pointer. And now we have two news in our constructor, and we have two deletes in our destructor. And it turns out those two news could leak memory. Because order of operations in that scenario is undefined. We could be allocating an X and then allocating a Y, and then one of those constructors could throw, and then we've leaked memory. This is bad. We just want to avoid this. Coding horror. Destructors are only called for fully constructed objects. And if the constructor throws, the object is not fully constructed. If you've got memory hanging around, it might leak. So let's just do the right thing. Use unique pointer. This is what it was designed to do. Wrap those raw resources. Guarantee exception safety. Guarantee no matter what, they get cleaned up properly. And look, no destructor exactly what we wanted. Uhura's name comes from the Swahili word Uhuru, meaning freedom, as in freedom from memory leaks. Let's look at one more related example, uh, because this was actually something that was common in our repository too. In Chekhov, we have a vector of pointers. Well, what kind of pointers are they? We know, because we can see the destructor here, that they are owning pointers, because we are deleting them. We're going through the service record, deleting all those pointers. But when you see a raw pointer in code, you should assume it is a non-owning pointer. It's just pointing to something that is owned by somebody else. So we're already kind of at odds with the C++ core guidelines, and there's a bunch of other potential problems. There's problems with exception safety. There's a problem of what happens if somebody later comes along and copies an element from the service record, then there's two pointers. What happens then? Uh, or removing an element without realizing it needs to be deleted. There's unclear ownership. This code doesn't capture the programmer's intent. 
There's just a lot of bad stuff going on here. Coding horror. Vector of unique pointers. Very clear what our intent is. Very clear that these are owned pointers. They are owned by the service record. They will be automatically cleaned up. We don't need our destructor anymore. Life is good. Assume if you see a raw pointer, it is non-owning. If it is owning, wrap it up in shared pointer or unique pointer. And this just goes along with the C++ core guidelines, which say, immediately give the results of an explicit resource allocation to a manager object. That's what we've been talking about, R-A-I-I. All right, next case study. Threads. This one was new to me. So I just learned something recently about threads. What do we think about this? We have a vector of threads, so a thread pool. And in our destructor, we are going through the pool saying, if each thread in the pool is joinable, join. And my first question to you, is this necessary? And indeed, shockingly to me, it is necessary. If you read the standard, I'm gonna read it to you. <laughs> the standard says, if you call a destructor on a thread that is joinable, the function terminate is called. Let me repeat that. <laughs> if you call a destructor on a thread that is still joinable, terminate is called. So yes, we have to do this. You must join threads before they are destroyed. Now the reason is, and I'll also quote the standard here, is note, either implicitly detaching or joining a joinable thread in its destructor could result, could result in difficult to debug correctness for detach or performance for join bugs encountered only when an exception is thrown. Thus, the programmer must ensure that the destructor is never executed while the thread is still joinable. I learned all this just a couple weeks ago. Next question. Is this a good pattern? Do we like this? This makes me feel a little uncomfortable that we have to do something for a standard object in a destructor. And my argument is, this is a coding horror. What should we do? So I'm talking about C++ 17. In C++ 20, there's a new type of thread. It's called jthread for joinable thread. Its destructor does the right thing. We've learned, I think, from our mistakes of the past. There's also a thread you can use now. It's in the guideline support library. It's called joining thread. It also does the right thing. Here's what joining thread looks like under the covers, and this will be no surprise to you. The destructor says, if joinable, join. And that's it. Like, there's a little more boilerplate, but that's it. The other thing it does is it removes the function detach because there is a core guideline that says don't detach a thread. You can read all about that. It's not really relevant to this talk. Hence, I recommend you use either jthreads if you're in C++ 20 or that you use joining thread in C++ 17. Question here. If you take this object and cast it back to a thread, can you still call detach? I believe the answer is yes. So this doesn't completely get rid of detach, but it's very clear what the intent is here. It's trying to uh, flag a misuse of detach. And again, you can read all about this in the core guidelines. Just look on detach in core guidelines. and It'll give you some advice on alternatives to using detach. Great, time for a new case study. Virtual destructors. 
This is standard memory resource. This is a relatively new object in the standard. And it is designed as a base class. It's an abstract interface that forms the basis of synchronized pool resources and monotonic buffer resources and so forth. And as you can see, there's some private virtual functions, pure virtual functions, and therefore there is a virtual destructor. And this is all good. We give it the emblem. When do you need to have virtual destructors, then, is the question. Virtual destructors guarantee that derived classes get cleaned up. So if you could ever be calling delete on a base pointer when the base pointer might be pointing to a derived class, you should have a virtual destructor. And as a general rule of thumb, you should have a virtual destructor if there are any virtual functions in your class. Because if you have a virtual function in your class, you are indicating to somebody reading that class, you could derive from this class. Guidelines say destructors should be virtual, destructors should be public. There are some idiomatic exceptions that are kind of rare. So in general, if you follow this rule of thumb, you will all be good. And there's lots of core guidelines about virtual destructors. And I will also point out that if you do the wrong thing here and you don't have a virtual destructor, the standard says if you destroy a derived pointer through a base pointer, it's undefined behavior if the base pointer doesn't have a virtual destructor. And with undefined behavior, anything could happen, including nothing. So just don't do this. Make sure your destructors are virtual when they need to be. This is a coding horror. This revolting hierarchy is for illustrative purposes only. Do not do this. Please do not do this. But it is useful for us to examine if you're ever in the situation where you're like, what order are things destroyed? So here we have a Spock object. Is the tricorder destroyed first or the phaser? Is the human part of Spock destroyed first or the Vulcan part? Is the id first or ego? Or is it the other way around? Most of the time, this doesn't matter. So this slide gives you the rule of thumb, which we talked about already. It's reverse order of construction. So specifically, the order of destruction goes like this. First thing to be destroyed is whatever is in the destructor body. So the code you wrote inside the Spock destructor, that is the first thing that is run. Then we run the destructors of the data members in reverse order of construction. So we constructed the tricorder first, then the phaser. So we destroy the phaser first, then the tricorder. Then we do the direct non-virtual base classes in reverse order, and then the virtual base classes in reverse order. So for this crazy code that you please should never write anything like it, here is the hierarchy, and the numbers show the order of destruction. So the Spock body is number one, then the phaser, then the tricorder, then the Vulcan part, and then we go, we recurse, and we do the two parts of the Vulcan, and then the human, but we do ego and id in reverse order because it is virtual. You never need to know this, but if you ever do, You've got this slide for reference, and you have the previous slide that shows order of deconstruction. Two important points. Important point number one, and this is the thing that you should remember, reverse order of construction. And important point number two, by the time we destroy the base class, the derived class is long gone. We'll see an example of this in just a moment. So now we know that when Spock died, his Vulcan half died first. Which brings us to our next case study. 
We have a base class, Helms person. We know it's a base class because it has a virtual destructor. That signals to us, oh, this is a base class meant to be derived from. And then we've derived Sulu from our base class. And we're calling release in the Helms person destructor. The intent here, which you'll see why this makes sense. The intent here is that when we're releasing the Helms person that we call Sulu release. That's our intent. But what happens here? Recall the order of deconstruction. Inside Helms person destructor, a call to virtual release cannot call Sulu release because Sulu, the derived class, has already been destroyed. It is gone. Hence, within the Helms person destructor, we call the Helms person release. Now, not only is this confusing to a programmer, in fact, I was the one who wrote code like this back in the day, and I can remember it was hell to debug what was going on. Virtual functions are not virtual inside destructors or constructors for that matter. So by the time we're in the Helms person destructor, Sulu does not exist. We call the release function of Helms person, which would be confusing, and in this case, also undefined behavior because it's a pure virtual function that is not implemented. Coding horror. So the comment is, I don't think compilers would compile this code because there's no release implemented in this instance. You still could have a pure virtual and an impl implementation of release, in which case, and I, I compiled this code, you just get a warning if you call release inside the destructor. It is true that a compiler, and the compilers do check and we'll give you a warning and probably say you're doing the wrong thing, but not necessarily. So that's why I call this out. So takeaway here, don't call virtual functions from destructors or constructors. And it gets even more complicated because sometimes what happens is you have maybe a function call inside a constructor or destructor that is not virtual that under the covers is calling a virtual function. And so you'll get in this scenario where it's not immediately obvious that you're calling a virtual function, but under the covers you are. Question? What if destructor calls the virtual function by specifying the class name, calling calling virtual function? So if you have fully qualified the name, it kind of depends. Like if you qualified the name as Sulu release, uh, what? What Sulu object are you calling? Like that wouldn't work. If you qualify the name as Helms person release, you would probably avoid the compiler warning in that case, and you would call Helms person release. But will that be normal? Will that be normal? What do you mean by normal? Uh, for example, if I want the Helms person person release to be a destruction. Mm -hmm. Will will that be okay, or will that still be uh, an undefined behavior? As long as the release function is implemented inside Helms person, that is defined behavior, and you would invoke the Helms person release function. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Don't call virtual functions from destructors or constructors. This code was from our repo, modified. Take a look, this is interesting. Inside this destructor, we're calling a few functions here. You could argue whether these are good functions to call, but let's leave that aside for the moment. We're calling those functions within a try catch block. We're catching all potential exceptions that could be thrown, and then we're just ignoring those exceptions. And the question is, is this reasonable? Is this a good idea? And the answer is, 
yeah, this is actually quite reasonable. Let's talk about this a bit. The standard library requires that all classes it deals with have constructors that never exit by throwing. Sorry, that have destructors that never exit by throwing. So here we have a case where potentially stop or reset or destroy could throw an exception. And the programmer is doing the right thing in this case. The programmer is saying, we cannot have an exception pump out of this destructor. So we will catch all exceptions and we will just throw them away. Let me get through this part and then we'll get to your question. So the reasoning is, let's imagine a exception has been thrown, validly thrown, and we are unwinding the stack. And as we unwind the stack, more destructors are getting called. And then another destructor throws an exception. What do we do? We don't know. And so the standard says, if another exception is thrown, well, this exception is in flight. Guess what? Terminate is called. Abort is called. No more destructors get called. We want to avoid that. Hence, destructors should never throw. This is a core guideline. A destructor may not fail. Nevertheless, try-catch should still be rare because it should be rare that you're calling a function from within a destructor that could throw. Most of the time, in a destructor, you're calling a function that is guaranteed not to throw, like delete. Did I get your question? Shouldn't we try to catch specific exceptions here? Yeah, like I can remove those exceptions, so maybe I can have my derived exception, so I guess it's, uh, no, what's the problem, you know? I guess it's like, <coughs> but now I'm assuming no duplication, but, uh, So the question is, shouldn't we catch specific exceptions so we kind of know what happens? You could argue that my, we might want to log that a specific exception happened and we could put that in the catch block and we could catch specific exceptions and log that a specific exception happened. The important part is no exception may propagate out of a destructor. So we must not rethrow any exception. We must catch everything here and make sure they don't propagate. Okay, great. So this is reasonable. And in addition, we should also flag this function as a no accept function. We're saying to the compiler and to the reader, this function cannot throw. And in fact, the core guidelines say, make destructors no accept. And if any function that you have may not throw, declare it no accept. Question. Uh, if stop throws, then reset and destroy will not be executed. That's correct. This seems to be, to me, not normal. Can you elaborate on that? Well, you could argue about whether we should, first I would argue that pads.reset probably doesn't need to be called in this case. Um, what I would normally have done here is identified the function that can throw and wrap that and done the right thing to make sure that all the correct functions do get called. Again, simplified just for ease of understanding. Okay, let's move on. So this is our non-throwing teleporter. Uh, I wanna go in kind of a deep dive that is going to lead up to vector destructors, which are one of the most interesting destructors. As you know, destructors are meant to be called automatically. That was a key part of my definition. And 99.99% .99 of the time, you never do want to directly call a destructor. But imagine a scenario where you have some special type of memory. Maybe you're working in, say, virtual reality research, and you have a device that has super fast memory and slow memory, or maybe secure memory, or maybe protected in some way. And you want to utilize that memory in a C++ way. You might do something like this. You have a special allocator that gives you a raw pointer to that special memory. You have a special version of free. And then you can do an amazing thing. You can call placement new and explicit destroy. Placement new 
is new that doesn't allocate anything. You pass a pointer to it that is already allocated, and it constructs an object at that location. So we construct a Kirk in this raw special memory. And then, of course, we have to remember to call the destructor, and it's not going to be called automatically. We have to do it ourselves because we invoked placement new. So in our destructor, we explicitly invoke the Kirk destructor. This is kind of unusual code if you haven't seen it before, but it is perfectly valid in this specific use case, which is pretty rare. Now, technically, I will point out that we should wrap the placement new in a try catch because if the Kirk destructor fails, we will leak that raw memory. So we should try and catch around the new, and if it fails, we should free that memory. But that code did not fit on this slide. So explicit destructors can be very useful and valid and necessary. Some example uses include the one you just saw with placement new. We're going to look at standard vector in just a moment. And I'm going to do just a brief side trip to talk about custom allocators. Question in the back. Yes, so should we encapsulate those individual objects? Absolutely. Yes, follow my previous advice as well. So if we want to play nicely with the standard, which uses, standard with, uh, uses custom allocators for containers, then we could derive from standard allocator and use our myalloc and myfree in the appropriate way. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Just show you an example of how we could use a custom allocator with the standard. And now for our special Kirk object, we have a my allocator that is a standards compliant allocator that's doing the right thing here. And now we know enough to do another case study on vector. A vector is a collection of T's in contiguous memory. So I'm showing an example here. There's eight slots in this vector. The first three are filled with valid objects, T0 through T2. And then there's five allocated slots, but they haven't been filled yet. And under the covers, a vector typically looks like this, has a pointer to the first element, a pointer to just beyond the last element, and a pointer to the end, so we know the capacity. And then somehow it's holding an allocator object if it needs to. This is optimized away if we don't need it. In the vector constructor, which I'm not going to show, you can imagine what happens if we create a vector of three elements. It's first going to allocate a big chunk of memory, because it has to be contiguous. So it's not going to allocate room for t0, and then t1, and then t2. That would not be efficient at all. Allocates a big chunk, maybe enough for eight elements, say. And then it uses placement new to construct t0 in place, t1 in place, T2 in place, because that's very efficient. So now imagine, knowing that, what the vector destructor must do. It probably does something like this. This is, would be a canonical implementation. This says, if there's any allocated block at all, then I need to destroy the objects. And I might destroy them first to last or last to first. That's unspecified. I call placement delete or explicit delete to make sure t0, t1, t2 are properly cleaned up. And then I deallocate that single chunk of memory in one fell swoop. But we can do better than this. First, we must take another slight detour and look at something that's new in C++14, which is destructor traits. So here we have a Gorn object, a string and an armor class. And we can, at compile time, evaluate some interesting properties of Gorn or any other object you may have. Is a Gorn destructible? Well, yes, it is, because we haven't declared the destructor as delete, for instance. Can we destruct this object without throwing an exception? Well, let's hope so. And yes, indeed, that's true. That's because string is a no-throw destructor. Is it trivially destructible? If it had two, 
integers or an integer in a float, it would be, but it has a string that is not trivially destructible. We have to call that destructor. So a Gorn is not trivially destructible, and it does not have a virtual destructor, all evaluated at compile time. So recall our vector destructor. Notice that we're running this loop and calling the destructor on each element. Even for a vector of a million ints or a million trivial objects, we call that destructor. That seems like overkill. Now, maybe the compiler could optimize that out for our release build, but for our debug build, probably those destructors are still getting called. It seems like we have an optimization opportunity here. And if T has a trivial destructor, we could avoid the loop altogether. And indeed, if you look at your implementation of standard library vector destructor, it probably looks something like this. If T is not trivially destructible, run those destructors. Otherwise, just skip that part and do this at compile time. This is a compile time evaluation. And then deallocate the memory. This is an industrial strength destructor. This shows the power of all of these things that we've talked about, including destructor traits that allow us to do some very cool optimization at compile time. Okay, we've learned a ton about destructor best practices. Here are some of my favorites. I'm just gonna call out a couple here. Um, the first one is no destructor. That is my all-time favorite. All of these others are reasonable, like asserting in destructors. That's a great thing to do. A destructor is a natural bottleneck because it's that one function that everything eventually goes through for every object. So validating invariance, things like that, that's useful. Uh, lock guard is a pretty common thing in a destructor where we need to set some shared data before we exit. And one I just added zero or secure zero memory. That's a, a Windows function to cryptographically clear memory. I do have free and delete in here. Of course, as I mentioned early, I recommend you wrap those resources. Hopefully you've realized that destructors get called a lot and they are called without us knowing, which is a benefit and a bane of destructors. So it is worth your while for those objects you're using a ton to make sure those destructors are as fast as possible. Some references for you. If you don't have a copy of the standard, uh, this link will take you to the last draft published prior to the standard. It's free. Core guidelines, destructors. Even though Bones is a doctor and not an engineer, damn it, I thought we could still summarize a couple healthy practices before we wrap this up. First is follow this, I call it the principle of minimalization, or think of it as less is more. So the best destructor, no destructor. Only declare destructors when they're actually needed. Avoid calling public functions, that's a red flag. Avoid unnecessary redundant work. RAII is your friend, take advantage of it. A bunch of other best practices. If you remember only one thing from this talk, this is the most important thing. The best destructor is no destructor. If you can get to that state of nirvana, life is good. Thank you. We're just about at 10. I can take maybe one or two questions. Thanks for the talk. Can you please go to slide six, I believe, with the definition of the destructor? What number? Slide six. Six? Six. Oh, my. Hang on. Yeah, you mentioned that the address of the destructor cannot be taken, it causes undefined behavior. Can you please elaborate on that? Uh, the standard actually says you may, you're not permitted to take the address of a destructor. 
And, and you, can you provide any reasoning for that? I honestly don't know the reasoning for that. Okay. And why do you say that the destructor has no name if we can call the destructor by a particular identifier? Yeah, the standard actually says that too. Uh, it says, and I have the quote here, since destructors do not have names, a using declaration cannot refer to a destructor for a base class. Uh huh. Uh, yes. Okay. I, I love quoting the standard Thanks. even when I don't understand it. <laughs> I think that was uh, our last question. I'll be happy to take questions individually. Thanks so much for coming. Have a great day.